Why don't we design like nature does? As designers, as engineers and innovators, we have sought little more than inspiration from nature. While the true potential of biomimicry and bio-inspired design and engineering has languished in the brilliant minds of a few. Thanks to computing, this is about to change. And as coders, we are drawn back to nature to understand how organisms manage limited resources by unpicking the processes which sit beneath descriptions of both form and function using algorithms. What are the rules? How do you understand one organism? How do you understand a collection of organisms? How do you understand the collection of organisms in a changing environment? Algorithms offer the seamless translation of innovation in nature to our technology-enabled and increasingly resource-limited world. And the secret to exploiting them lies with swarms, the structures they create, and the materials they build with. I think the remarkable thing about natural systems is that they manage to do so much with so little. Biomimicry, at its best, it offers a synthesis between the best that human ingenuity can produce and the amazing resource of research and development which evolution could, could be regarded as. Here in rural Namibia, we may feel a world apart from our understanding of science and technology, but the cutting edge of research is happening right here, right now. The research here has implications for sustainability and climate change, but the projects are as diverse as looking at water balance and even swarm robotics on Mars. If you're wondering where the future lies, it's right here. As researchers, we are looking to capture the processes we find in nature and translate these into computer code. In computing, we use the term algorithm, and with algorithms, we hope to learn the rules of life. Like a game, simple rules lead to complex outcomes. Simply looking at the rules and copying the results has been done before. What we're doing here is looking at the processes or how something becomes real. Whether we use the term algorithm or process is irrelevant. So the similarity between a computer program and a biological system are striking. They're very much acting the same way. And I think to me that's why the analogy of going to nature and trying to figure out how does nature deal with these things becomes, comes very naturally because it has the same principles and the same foundation as computational thinking does. The essence of a digital system is just like a biological system, is the code. You know, in the biological system, it, it's DNA, it's the genetic code that programs. And that code doesn't program a shape or a form like an architect's drawing does. It programs a process that leads to something. One of the simplest algorithms inspired by nature is one that describes a murmuration or a flock of birds, or indeed a school of fish. These complicated shapes and forms that we see are a simple interaction of those rules played out against an environment. You could define a flock of starlings fairly easily via a computer script where you tell each bird to move forward and adjust its speed and direction. And it adjusts it to three parameters. One of them is cohesion, which basically means that you, you find where your nearest mates are and you try to move towards the center of gravity them because you don't want to be alone. The second one is alignment, and it basically means that you're trying to align your, your direction, your traveling and your velocity to that of, of your closest neighbors. And the third one is, is well, essentially collision avoidance. If you get too close to someone, steer away. Now those three rules, called the Boyd system, and it's essentially an agent system, they allow you to describe with incredible accuracy, you know, essentially just a few lines of code, 
something which really resembles a flock of starlings. And that's the logic of the agent system. You define the agents, they're, they're simple, they respond to the local thing. They don't have a holistic view, they don't see the, the, the top-down view, but they see their neighbours and they respond to their neighbours. So it's not simply that they're following three rules, it's how those rules play out within that swarm. Imagine a predator or a bird of prey coming in, the swarm will instantly be able to modify and adapt to that changing condition. Here's a, another classic example of a nature-inspired algorithm. Ants foraging to and from, finding optimal pathways, those simple rules played out that allow them to adapt to any change that's placed in their path. Now we're not here to talk about ants, we're here to talk about nature's builders. direction is north so that when we reconstruct them in 3D we have like kind of a reference but also we can determine if there's a lean in any of them. This is a termite mound though not a particularly large mound. It is the product of millions of termites working to a simple set of rules by which they seek to place pieces of mud to stabilize an otherwise unstable world. People have used termites for inspiration before. During the 1990s, Mick Pierce received a commission for an office block in Harare, Zimbabwe. The reality of the situation there demanded something radical. Much has been said about the Eastgate Center, but it's best to get it from Mick himself. It began when his daughter sent him a video of David Attenborough narrating the vast spaces beneath termite mounds in West Africa. But on its underside is what I think is really the most remarkable animal structure I've ever seen. Lines of concentric... I saw this guy wandering around underground and immediately thought, well, why do they live underground? The thermal mass, the, the, the fact is it's a stable environment. That was right mind-boggling. I thought, we put our air into ducts in pipes around the building, but there the air and the occupants are in the same space. So you have to think of the occupant and the air movement as one thing, one uh, or con deeply connected. So um, it helped enormously to sort of rethink the way we air condition buildings. If you want to save energy, you need to make use of the structure because that is uh, a perfect thermal store. We then develop these floors with teeth in them. So at night we have big fans pushing air through the building. We use the cold night air to cool the teeth down and the uh, thermal mass in the building. Eastgate was tuned for years until its performance culminated in a saving of approximately 80% over a standard air conditioning system. This constant adaptation is generations old in humans. It predates a time of globalization and the availability of modern building materials. Like termites, people used what was at hand. Skills were passed from father to son, and we call this vernacular architecture. Well, vernacular architecture or vernacular design, if you want, is typically architecture which isn't global, it, it isn't industrial, but it, it comes from its surroundings. So typically it's what indigenous people do, it's what you know, European architecture was in the, the Middle Ages and much later than that. And it's a process which is strikingly similar to, to biological system. So you, you don't have architects and engineers designing the buildings, you have local craftsmen um, and they are not as we're used to today, designing a building, but they are they're doing a process, they're doing things they know well. They know how to lay the bricks in the local area, they know how to respond to the local conditions, and they know how, how, how things used to be done. Mm. And they, you know, they'll build a house the way their father built a house, or you know, whoever it may be, and it'll work because it has worked. And sometimes they make a little adjustment to their thing because they think that this would be 
neat or this might be work better and if it does they'll you know they'll go and teach that to their children or, or to their apprentice human designs and aspirations have led us away from vernacular architecture and modern industrial methods now dominate the problem is that these designs must cope with multiple environments and they struggle to adapt the definition of vernacular is building without architects, architecture without architects, done in a traditional manner, um, hand-built. However, I feel that it merges into architecture because when you look at most of the, the buildings in Europe, um, buildings that are older than 150 years, they define, you could define them as vernacular, but yet they con constitute the architecture of many of the cities and, and many, many of the local areas. So I quite like the idea of a hybrid, you know, that you're not, you're not going to be exclusive. I'm a modern architect or I'm a traditional architect, but that you, you use what you can. It's a bit like scavenging. I, I always say I'm a scavenger architect because the, I'm a scavenge materials, you know. So I think one can scavenge ideas and you can scavenge styles and, and images and so on. What I don't like is if that there's a kind of adoption of a style without any regard of its origins um, and where it comes from. It must have meaning, it must make some sense and it must fit the materials um, and the context where it's built. As we strive for solutions in an uncertain future, we come back to the question of how termites survive in these extreme environments. I think very broadly the termite mount is an example of where you see a convergence of a physical system, earth, if you like, mud, clay, uh, being modified by organisms. That's biology, if you want. Uh, and that modification changes the properties of locally the earth, so it creates a mound, which then leads to behavioral changes in the termite. So it's a beautiful example of a problem where you cannot address just the physical aspects or just the biological aspects. You need to essentially address them simultaneously because one informs the other. As Maha says, we need to consider both. And while we're talking about the termites, we need to consider the material they build with. Like the vernacular tradition, they use what comes to hand. How does this dirt become so smart? Nature has to make do with what's around. And the intriguing thing about that is that although the molecules and bonds, of chemical bonds that nature uses, are themselves not terribly exciting. Mother of Pearl, for instance, which is a well-known one, which is 95% chalk, the worker fracture, if you like, the amount of energy you have to put into breaking a piece of chalk is, in technical terms, half a joule per meter squared, something like that. You work on Mother of Pearl, 95% chalk, and it's 3,000 times tougher than that. And the only difference, well, the major difference rather, is that it's made up of lots of little platelets. That opens up a number of possibilities because you say, well, actually, it doesn't matter what material you make it out of. The difficult thing is orientating the platelets. The difficult thing is putting it all together. What Julian describes is no different than the problem that termites face every day. This looks like a pile of mud, but is actually an interface between the inside and the outside. This pile of mud actually regulates the flow of moisture and respiratory gases. It's the lungs of the mound, and it creates an environment inside in which both termites and the fungus can thrive. So if we can use basic materials to do smart things, then can we move towards a new type of architecture? The world of architecture is very much in a time of transition where it's starting to learn and understand the possibilities of the digital uh, era, or so to say. <clears throat> so both on a design and a fabrication level, we're just vastly expanding our ability to create complexity, to control complexity. Um, and architects and, and the world, the cultural world, are embracing this to a great extent and they're doing these things and they're learning them. but. One of the things that's not 
that's still an open question in the world of architecture is what do we do with it what's it for so it's essentially an, an, a question of being able to deal with complexity that we couldn't manage or we couldn't engage with previously mm. and now we're looking for ways of, of using that uh, using that ability to something productive and constructive Studying termite mounds because they offer some clues into how you can capture natural sources of energy, in this case energy that's in turbulent wind, to help uh, power physiological function, like in this case gas exchange, the respiratory gas exchange, the same function that is that is uh, uh, carried out by our own lungs. If you look at wind energy, there are really two conventional ways that we try to tap wind for energy. One of them is to build wind turbines that are hooked up to generators and wind turns those generators and generates electricity and it's distributed through the grid as any other source of electricity would be. The other typical way of dealing with uh, wind is to build a very, very tall building. This is an energy gradient between winds high off the ground and winds close to the ground and engineers can tap that source of energy as well. Tapping wind from high off the ground, what's called the boundary layer, uh, down to the surface of the ground, that's more reliable, and so a lot of building designs go to that. Now, if you look around at these termite mounds, they have no moving parts. They aren't particularly tall. They just tap turbulent wind energy by virtue of their structure. They just capture all those frequencies, and it filters some out and it admits others into the mound air space itself. Now, we don't quite understand how it works. We have uh, a good, pretty good understanding that it actually happens. This is a challenge that uh, physicists are interested in. Uh, dealing with turbulence is not something that physicists or engineers are used to dealing with, and, uh, and yet here are some creatures that are using uh, turbulence in some quite creative ways. Always there is excitement at boundaries because boundaries are dynamic, they uh, change easily, and we make a lot of mistakes when you're at boundaries. So we have to rethink many ideas in physics because physics has typically dealt with systems which are not sentient, they're not active. Uh, so you deal with, physics deals with how matter, energy, and information are converted from one to the other. Um, and in the systems that physics typically has treated until now, um, we don't have systems which are self-aware, which can then respond to each other and to the environment. They've been ignored? Or? Sorry? They've been ignored? No, it's not just they've been ignored. They've just not been treated. Uh, because there are lots of other questions which were, in some real sense, simpler and still needed to be properly addressed mathematically. Yeah. But now, biology data uh, from biology, data from biology on all scales, at the molecular scale, cellular scale, organismic and ecological scale, is starting to essentially pose very exciting challenges for people coming from mathematics and physics, where the questions are now different because this kind of matter Biological matter is sentient, it's active, it can respond to the environment, it can respond to other organisms like itself. What are the rules? Uh, you know, how do you understand one organism? How do you understand a collection of organisms? How do you understand a collection of organisms in a changing environment? So there are beautiful challenges, and so it's very natural that the community starts to think about these kinds of questions, and it also is very natural that the boundaries between different disciplines uh, starts to break down because the questions that arise require you to bring tools and techniques from many different disciplines. So the really broad topic that I think all of this falls under the heading of uh, is complex systems. The world is full of these systems of independent components with interesting collective behavior, uh, and we want to understand how the low-level rules give rise to the emergent collective results and, and uh, also the engineering kind of question, if you want a particular high level result, how do you design low level rules for that? I mean, normally we engineer systems where, you know, every component is known and we plan exactly what everything's going to do in advance. That's not the way the termite colony builds, right? You've got an unknown number of insects. They're all sort of going around doing their own thing, which is harder for us to deal with, harder for us to think about, but it has all these advantages. It's very robust. You know, you can kill half the termites and the other half will keep working. Not that we have killed half the termites, <laughs> but it, you could. Like, you know, an anteater gets in, it doesn't make a big difference to the, the colony. And so if we can engineer systems that work like that, you know, hopefully we can 
get some of the same advantages. With automation, we can potentially start building whole new types of structures that we never dreamt of before. And so one exciting approach to this is the whole new 3D printing era, right? where we can 3D print houses and all kinds of new structures, and we can even insert different elements. But another way to think about it, right, is that if we can surpass the 3D printer, if we can instead have little mobile 3D printers, if you will, that don't necessarily build with custom material, but even build with on-site in-situ construction material, right, then we're expanding beyond our wildest dreams, right? And that, that could go anywhere towards uh, deep sea construction to extraterrestrial construction. And um, of course, that's, that's one of the research areas we're targeting. From all this, we are trying to distill a fundamental termite construction algorithm that describes the process, and with this algorithm, we can replay it within digital fabrication platforms and apply it to human applications. One of our objectives is to discover how swarms of organisms, whether termites, cells, or indeed social weaver birds, integrate many functions within one solution. Integration is where one object does many things. Imagine a house where all the components from the windows, the doors, the ventilation, the wiring and the insulation were all made of a single construction material and a single process spread across millions or thousands of tiny builders, each one placing small bricks to no plan. If we can build little agents, little robots mm. that can do what termites do, then you're essentially creating a diffuse 3D printer. If we could get to a place where we could harness that concept, then you have yeah. some real ability to have economy in, yeah. in building. We will never, you know, fully exploit what we have there. We, we have just begun to understand uh, what, what kind of treasure we have. For me, one, one of the things that's really appealing about biology as a source is that in many ways that is what I think we need to get towards. So if, if you think of a city, a city of the future that would be truly sustainable in the genuine sense of, of the term, um, I think that would look a lot like a, a complex living organism or superorganism. This word superorganism comes from termites. In his book, The Soul of the White Ant, Eugene Murray asked us to believe that the mound is a living entity, that it's greater than the sum of its parts. Now, that's exactly where we are today. What this means is that we have an ability to translate or capture processes from nature and bring these from the biological world into the digital world. The termite construction algorithm is just the first of many where scientists will go into nature and harvest processor algorithms and deliver these to the digital world. What will this world look like? Here's Julian Vincent. So let's go back to the thing of trying to understand how you can marry biology and engineering together. Because a lot of people are trying to do that. And mostly everybody does it with a database. And for, I've tried doing that and it doesn't work. And from my perspective, it's because all a database can do is record history. It can't show you where you're supposed to be going. It can't give advice. So we have Tim Berners-Lee trying through computing to increase everybody's skills at communication. And one of the outputs of that has been web ontology language, otherwise known as OWL. By a sort of primary school way of constructing sentences, subject, verb, object, this sort of approach, you can construct sentences, but then using classical logic, you can pull those sentences together and not only make them mean something and move off in a number of directions, but make them actually make inferences. You can, for instance, say a man is a male, a man is a father, I have a father whose name is Charles. From that, you can then deduce that Charles is a man's name, but you haven't actually said it. There are ontologies for gene functions, molecular pathways, and protein folding. There are ontologies for car designs, aerospace engineers and architects. Ontologies are connected and smart, and as we use them, we reinforce new pathways or discoveries within them, like ants finding an optimal path to food. And ontologies can integrate across applications to track functions directly 
from jeans to racing cars. And it doesn't take much imagination to realize that this will be the domain of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Anyone who makes the assumption that moving over to a kind of algorithmic design or a computational design paradigm and building paradigm means that the human is left out of the equation is wrong. Uh, I don't think that this will ever mean that the designer as a person doing design for very subjective needs and, and desires is going to be replaced. To me, the digital tools, the computational aspects are not about replacing the person. They are about extending our ability of engaging with complex and discontinuous contexts. The mound itself is actually a reflection of the termites interacting with soil in a particular way, basically building an environment that they feel comfortable in. And that kind of process uh, is, uh, if you're going to do a biologically inspired building, uh, ultimately, we're going to have to build that kind of process into it. Uh, uh, some means whereby the occupants of a building can modify uh, the building to suit their needs. In other words, to make the building a part of the occupant's uh, physiology. And that's very much uh, um, contrary to the way that most architects think. Most architects think that uh, they build a building and occupants live in them, and that the architects are the ones who control uh, the environment in which people live. We're talking about really turning things over, actually architects being the facilitators of a process between the occupants of a building and the building that they live in. There's something much more profound and fundamental in really understanding the, the nature of a morphogenetic process, which is very, very different from the linear nature of architecture and construction or any engineering, to be honest, today. There's always resistance to change. That's uh, something that's going to happen and and there's going to be blood. So, <laughs> but, you know, that's, uh, whenever there is change, that is the nature of change. We have seen why this setting is so important for our future. What other secrets will these much maligned insects have to teach us? We are at the transition where 3D printers, then swarm construction robots, using the termite construction algorithm, will sense their environment as they build. What if we task this phenofabrication technology to work alongside termites reconstructing a termite mound? What if this technology can learn new algorithms directly from any organism it interacts with, seamlessly learning and translating algorithms to an intelligent fabrication technology. Sounds crazy? We're about to find out. A final thought. What is our future when technology and nature co-evolve, where we move from a sense of separation from nature to reclaiming our place within it. Yeah.